Wow. Well, happy Sunday. Excited you're here. Everybody look around and wave at somebody. Very good. That's, that's greeting in Corona land. Excited we get to hang out this morning and spend this time together and just celebrate God's goodness and all that. And uh, No, you're fine. Hey, look, hang out up here with me. It's all right. I might ask you questions. I'm just kidding. I mean, because you feel it, right? I mean, we lost. Oh, yeah. We lost, y'all. I can't believe everybody's feeling the disappointment and the depression and everybody's feeling the weight of losing. But, you know, when they started into the first overtime, I really thought the Tigers had a chance. So y'all didn't know what I was talking about, did you? 11.30 last night, Notre Dame beat Clemson. And I was sorely disappointed even at 11.30. But you know what? Even though they lost, okay, read between the lines. God's still on his throne. And we continue to move forward. Because God's good. God continues to work and God continues to do. And we get to be a part of what he's doing. And that's where we need to hang out. So, anyway, excited that we get to hang out. And get to to, to do what God sets before us. Right? Because, I mean, we're going to obey God before we obey anything. and Or anybody. And and that's important. So, just stick right there. All right? So, a couple things I want to make you aware of is, is because I got a sticky note here. It's a bright chartreuse color. So, uh... I know that I can see it. It says Thanksgiving Gathering Lunch, Thursday, November 19th. Sign up sheet at the Connect booth out there uh, for cooking food or see Nick if you'd like to help. So we're going to do the uh, Thanksgiving luncheon on Thursday, the 19th. It's all takeout. We're going to prepare takeout plates and give them away. This is, no, this is a non-charge kind of event, and so folks show up. They get turkey dinner on the 19th. So uh, if you want to help, see Nick. If you want to sign up to cook something, there's a sign-up sheet out there to cook, you know, like... that. This is where I, every year, y'all, this is where I mention green bean casserole with onions on it. Them, them, them crispy onions. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Yeah, that's a, t- that's a TV commercial. But there's Nick back there. Wave your hand, Nick. There you go. See Nick if y'all want to see Nick about the, about the Thanksgiving lunch and things. Second thing is, today's meeting day, y'all. So deacons meet at 3.30. Lead team meets at 4 o'clock. And the administrative team meets at 5. And we're putting together the budget and the nominating uh, team stuff for the new year. And, and, and all of that will be in print next Sunday uh, so that you get a look at it a month before we have our annual church conference on Wednesday night, I think, December 16th, something like that. Just giving you some, pointing it out there. So, so today we're continuing these things, and, and it's kind of fun. I'm enjoying these things. Uh, Peter shares it that way. He says, regarding these things, talking about salvation in Christ and what God has provided through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And then he says, because these things are so incredible that even angels long to get a glimpse of these things. And so folks, all week long when God speaks, when God moves, when we read and study and and hear and sense the presence of God, these are God things. These things that God's at work in us and through us and giving us opportunity to move out and to be and and all that kind of thing. I I just, I'm enjoying these things and not just simply the, the, the text of the passage and that sort of thing. I'm enjoying the things that God's doing. I mean, it, it's funny, uh, too, uh, what was it? It was Thursday a week ago, right? We were, I was walking with, with Will. Will takes one of my walking buddies. And on Thursday morning, we meet up about 7.30 and walk about four miles. And so we were just trudging along, do, 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 having our conversations, talking, having a great time. And, and we usually stop at the truck before we quit walking and we pray. Well, we were at, ran into another gathered scattered. Um, Carl West is coming up the sidewalk after, at us, and we're going this way. And so we just stop in the sidewalk. Right? And we start talking, just pray, you know, just praising God and thankful to be able to see each other, hang out, and say, <clears throat> and then just by that time, uh, we started to walk out and I went, whoa, let's pray. So we huddled right there on the sidewalk out on 50, and all three of us just spent time praying together. Just right down the sidewalk and said, hey, this was a God thing. This is a these thing, y'all. This is one of these things that God has given us because we're brothers in Christ and we can stop on the sidewalk in the middle of public and pray. Okay? All right. So there you go. That's of these things. You can follow Jesus or you can follow the world. Did you know that? You can follow Jesus or you can follow the world. These things. Today's message is two paths. Two paths to follow. Listen to these verses from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. 
Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same understanding. Because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin. Or some translation says has finished with sin. Um, interpretation will lead you to the, whichever translation you want to go with. One who, has su- who, one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin in order to live the remaining time in the flesh no longer for human deci- desires, but for God's will. Now listen to this, verse 3. This is just, uh, <laughs> it, it's just taking me back a few years. For there has already been enough time spent in doing what the Gentiles choose to do. Now listen to the list, y'all. <laughs> It says, carrying on in unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and lawless idolatry. All right, so here we let's do it again. For there has already been enough time spent in doing what the Gentiles choose. Now, why does he say Gentiles? Because the Jews and, and, and those Jews who have awakened to, to the salvation that is, is given and received in Jesus Christ, you know, they have received this salvation and have been set apart, called out from the, the ecclesia, have been called out from the world. And so, so, so Paul, Peter is differentiating between us who have been called out by God to, to enjoy and celebrate salvation in Jesus Christ and setting us apart from all the rest of the world and Gentiles is all they knew it at at that time. Uh, we could come up with all kinds of names, couldn't we? <laughs> let's, okay, let's go ahead. No, I'm just kidding. They are surprised that you don't join them in the same flood of wild living and they slander you. How about that verse right there? <laughs> That, that, are they surprised that you don't... Uh, I shouldn't ask it that way, should I? This is a statement, not a question. They are surprised that you don't join them in the same flood of wild living and they slander you. They will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was also preached to those who are now dead. So that although they might be judged in the flesh according to human standards, they might live in the spirit according to God's standards. Now, here you go. I'm going to make a statement that if you have chosen a camp, it's going to rub, rub wrong both ways. God, in his sovereignty, has given you the opportunity to choose. God, in his sovereignty... His ultimate control over all the universe has given you the opportunity to choose. Now, let's look at this passage a minute before we start breaking that down a little bit. You ready? Since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves. All right. If I say to you, let me pick on Jim right there. Jim, if I said arm yourself, Jim, you have a choice, don't you? You can either arm yourself or not. Right? I mean, the very fact that Scripture says to do something sets up this opportunity of choice. You can either arm yourself or not arm yourself. That's that kind. Ready for the next one? Here we go. Also with the same understanding because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin. This is the idea that when you have rejected the sin, you're going to suffer in the world. Because you can follow Jesus or you can follow the world. You can follow Jesus or you can follow the flesh. You can follow Jesus or you can follow the devil. All three statements are the same. I'm sorry. World, flesh, Satan. It's all the same. Okay? You can make those choices. So here you go. Arm yourself for suffering or turn from sin and suffer. Pick. You know, it reminds me, it, it, it reminds me of, of those little notes we used to send in the third grade. I like you. Do you like me? Check yes or no. Remember that? <laughs> Inevitably, y'all, mine would always come back, no. <laughs> I don't know what Angie was thinking 26 years ago. So, so here you go. The very fact that Scripture gives a... a sort of a direction or a statement or or call it an imperative you choose 
Shall we travel back a few thousand years? Don't eat from that tree. Right? Don't take authority into your own hands for something I've told you not to do. Don't be your own God. Right? Look at it. I mean, you can follow Jesus or you can follow the world. Which are you following? There's two paths. All right, that's just the introduction. Y'all ready for the message? <laughs> what does it mean to follow Jesus? You can follow Jesus, you can follow the world. What does it mean to follow Jesus? It means that you make what pleases God the most important thing in your life. Not what pleases you. Dare I say what pleases your spouse or friends or family. What pleases the world around you, your bosses, whatever. You please God first. If you're going to follow Jesus, you seek in every way to please God first. I listened to a podcast yesterday while I was walking, and it, it, it was a three-point thing from Al Mohler, who is the president of Southern Seminary. And he said, go and, and, and the title of the book is called The Gathering Storm. I didn't like that he put gathering in the title, but anyway. Um, but he said in there, he says, there's three things that every family must do. You must make it the ultimate priority of your family to be in and have your kids in worship church together see i came through that that period of time in family life where yeah we went to church 95 percent of the time right but if it was summer we might go to the lake and ride in the boat right what he's saying is that, yeah, a lot of Christian families go to church and they take their kids to church. But do they, do they communicate with their family and their church that we do this because it is the ultimate priority of who we are as a part of the body of Christ? Do we communicate with our kids? Do our kids get that? Well, with the number of kids leaving the body of Christ and the nuns, See, then, then somehow we haven't communicated that this, we do this because this is ultimately the priority of our lives, is to gather as a part of the body of Christ. We're the body of Christ. We gather as the part of the body of Christ. Come together. Second thing he says, he says, be careful of technology. Families must be careful of technology. Screen time. My son and I did a little, he's going to kill me for telling you all this, so don't tell him I told you. We, we did a little math equation last night. My son has a, has a corner desk. Well, he actually has a six-foot table and a desk. And he's got a TV on the wall and a computer screen in this corner and a computer screen in front of him. And last night I walked in there and this computer screen was playing one thing. His phone was playing something else. And his computer in front of him had something else on it. I said, son, in one hour... You will have completed your three hours of screen time. Three times one hour equals three hours. He went, no, 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 that's not how it works. Right? Be careful of technology. Third thing. The fragrance of the gospel must permeate your home. Those are the three things that Al Mohler said. For families going forward. And this is why he said it. He said because no matter what's going on in the world around us. The essential basic building block of our culture is the family. I was like. I'm using that in the morning. Right? Following Jesus. Romans 12 verses 1 and 2. Therefore brothers and sisters in view of the mercies of God. In view of what God's done for you, in view of these things that God has provided for you, in view of the adoption, the redemption, the regeneration, the sanctification positionally, the sanctification process that God's taking you through, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. I urge you.
Listen to what Paul's saying right there in Romans. I urge you to. Recognizing that, guess what? They don't have to. They don't have to present their bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. But he says, I urge you to because God has called you out. Because God has raised you up. Because God has saved you. Because God has redeemed you. Because God has given you hope in a hopeless world. Present yourselves as a living sacrifice. I heard one preacher say the problem with living sacrifice is it keeps crawling off the altar. Right? Two. Do not be conformed to this age. Some of your translations say this world. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern, understand, choose what is good, pleasing, what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. See that? The very fact that Paul is encouraging it means you have a choice. Will you do it or will you not? Okay? Are you choosing Jesus or the world? Following Jesus. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to be following Jesus. We're supposed to be going where Jesus goes. We're supposed to be thinking. I mean, that's what he says right there. He says, arm yourselves also with the same understanding. Have the same mind that Christ had about suffering in the world because he wouldn't be what the world wanted him to be. Second point, following the flesh. Flesh, world, Satan. Flesh, world, Satan. Which are you following? Following Jesus? Following the flesh. The world likes conformity. Do y'all know that? The world loves conformity. It, it, it likes a static system, a stasis, where, where, where things even out. That's why in church for a generation, here's what we've done. Well, I'm as good as they are. You know, if Jesus had been sitting in that aisle over there, you couldn't do that. Well, I'm as good as, oh, no, I'm not. Right? See, we, we, we've tried to even it out and say, well, I'm at least as good as other Christians. Well, I'm at least as good as the other people in my congregation. Right? See, no, that's not our comparison. That's not the rod set, set in our midst. It's not the measuring line Jeremiah talked about. We look at the person and work of Jesus Christ, and that's what God's transforming us into from one degree of glory to the next. The world says, do like we do. Because if we're all doing it, then I don't feel so judged. I don't feel so bad in my sin when everybody else is doing it with me. Let's go back. All right, so here you go. Ready? For there has already been enough time spent in doing what the Gentiles choose to do. Just insert world flesh there. Carrying on in unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and, and lawless. Should I preach on each of those? Let's talk about unrestrained behavior. You know, that is absolutely counter to what the fruit of the, the last fruit of the Spirit mentions in Galatians 5, self-control. How about evil desires? What's an evil desire? Evil desire is that which pleases me above everything else. Now, serving God can be pleasing to me. But evil is that thing that I says, you know what? I'm stepping on everybody to get what I want. That's evil gosh, I shouldn't be preaching this right after the elections. Probably shouldn't have said that either, but I did. How about drunkenness? See, this is the one teenagers used to always ask me about, college students. Is it a sin to drink a beer? Not according to the Bible. It just, is it a sin to drink a case? Yes. Because you end up in drunkenness. Drunkenness is indeed a sin. Orgies. Shall I define it? I didn't think so. Carousing. <laughs> Lawless idolatry. 
If you don't, no, here you go. If we're all doing it, then we don't feel judged or condemned. If you don't like, if you don't do like we do, then we will attack you as wrong or contrary. So we remove the judgment we feel because you act like you're better than us. Folks, that's the attitude of the world. It's the attitude of the world. Are you following Jesus or are you following the flesh? Then you have to be confronted by the this last two verses. Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 and 14 says, Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction and there are many who go through it. See, this, this, this is in the context of the Sermon on the Mount in the book of Matthew. And Jesus, this is kingdom preaching. Remember, I've told you before, Jesus, Mark tells us that Jesus went about preaching the gospel of God. Gospel of God means the good news of God. And in other places it says Jesus went about teaching of the kingdom. The parables were about the kingdom. About the ki- This is the way it is in the kingdom. You've heard it said this. But this is the way the kingdom is. And if you pray. Pray. Thy will be done. On earth. As it is in heaven. Right? So, so, so the, 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 the path to the kingdom. Starts with a gate. What gate? Jesus. Jesus is the gate to the sheepfold. Jesus is the one who provides entrance into the kingdom. Jesus is the one who calls us out and and, and, and brings us to the presence of God, the holy of holies. See that? Enter through the narrow gate. Okay? Um, Anybody been to Rock City? No? Okay, it's up in Chattanooga area up there somewhere. And, and there's some places up there where you, you go through these, they, they, these carved out rocks. I don't know. Somebody had a lot of time on their hands. Um, anyway, and, and some places you got to, like this, through, through these little gaps in the rock. Right? Enter through the narrow gate. What is he saying right there? He's saying, guess what? I'm not giving you the easy path. I'm doing the work. Jesus is saying, I'm doing, have done the work that provides the gate. And I'm calling you to come through this gate. Because other than this gate, you got everything else out there. The the gate is wide. And the road is a freeway that leads to destruction. Right? There's a bumper sticker, and I, I really meant to order it once upon a time. It said, if there's a stairway to heaven and a highway to hell, it pretty much tells you what to expect in the traffic. Any of y'all ever seen that? I saw that on a bumper of a car, and I went, that is the greatest bumper sticker in the world. There's a stairway to heaven and a highway to hell. Pretty much tells you what the traffic is expected to be, right? Enter through the narrow gate. For the gate is wide. The road is broad. That leads to destruction and there are many who go through it. Now, I had this conversation some time ago. I forget. It's been years. I've had it probably multiple times. But I've had, had people express their concern over the, the decline of one or the other. The decline of Christianity or the decline of the Christian church. And, and people want to, you know, pull up uh, things like Barna and, and, and Pew Research polls and stuff like that and say, do you realize that um, Christianity is shrinking and, and churches are closing their doors and da da da. Yeah. And there's no telling how many churches have closed their doors in the last eight months. We don't know. 
I know that about 20 years ago, I was sitting on the general mission board of the Maryland Baptist Convention when uh, David Lee presented the numbers from some recent research that said every day in America, this is 20 years ago, every day in America, 14 churches close their doors. Every day. And I looked at that and I went, <gasps> oh no. But then I balanced that against something that some great pre preacher, I think it's attributed to Billy Graham, but I don't know if he said it and I didn't do the research to find out. But his statement was, is that any given Sunday morning, three quarters of the people sitting in churches across America don't know Jesus. So is Christianity shrinking or is God pruning? You know what? Just my opinion. But I think the answer to that is clear. There's some dead limbs that were never fruitful for the kingdom. Now, I'm, I'm not the judge of salvation. God's the, God's the one who saves. Guess what? You can't work for salvation. I, I'm not... I, you know, I ride down the middle of the lane, <laughs> even on 17. Um, you see, there are those who lean this way and those who lean that way, right? God saves. I don't save myself. Nothing I can do but receive it, okay? That's what I got. Enter through the narrow gate. Yes, Lord. So God wants to hear from me. Yes, Lord. Right? For the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction. There are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life and few find it. Therefore, since Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same understanding. Folks. Everything. In this world. Is not worth. What we have in Jesus. Be willing to give it all up. Sacrifice it all. Even. To the point of death. Because the one who suffers in the flesh is finished with sin. In order to live the remaining time in the flesh, remain live the remaining time in the flesh, no longer for human desires, but for God's will. All right, so y'all don't get the children's time at eight ten anymore. But this is the children's time this morning. It's not as pretty as Lee as uh, Trudy's, but I'm gonna ask the kids in the next hour. Hey, you like my hat? I don't imagine kids are gonna like this hat very much. It's not a ball cap. It's not very well decorated. But you know what it does? It keeps the sun from causing spots on my head and ears that the dermatologist has to burn off. So I wear it when I'm in the sun. Now, it says gathering right here. And if you'd like one, let me know. I can order more. It says gathering right there. And I'm going to say, kids, how do y'all like my hat? And they're going to say, some of them are probably going to say no. Some of them are going to say yes. You know what? When you get kids down front, you never know what they're going to say. Right? But I brought this one. Guess what? I got probably a dozen hats. In my house. Got one has got a little Adidas thing right there. I got one that's even floppier. It'll cover my shoulders. <laughs> right? Got ball caps that say Harley Davidson. Dixon football. I could have picked any of them. This morning. But I picked this one. How do you like it? Maybe you don't like bucket hats. Go ahead. Criticize me. Malign me. Talk bad about my hat. 
I'll endure that suffering. See my point? Can you see the point? Choose Jesus over everything else. Doesn't matter what the world thinks. Doesn't matter what they say. And ultimately, it doesn't matter what they do. We've heard the stories of young people. And I don't know the truth or the faults of it. I, I, I don't know. I've just read the same kind of accounts that you've read. That when a gunman walks into a school in Colorado and points a gun at a kid and says, Are you a Christian? And they say, Yes. And they pull the trigger. That's, we would say that's suffering. Really, that's the parents' suffering. Because that kid that knows Jesus just entered his presence. You following Jesus, you following the world, the flesh, enter through the narrow gate. Because it leads to life. Pray with me. Father, thank you for today and just for your love. And God, I want to thank you. We live in a world of opposites. We live in a world of dichotomy. We live in a world where it's this or that. It's us or them. It's my way or the highway. It's And God, it has set us against each other even within the body of Christ. God, help us to follow you, not opinion, not party, not politics. God, help us to love you first. God, help us individually to live the life that you've called us to, to be the people you've called us to be. God, this world loves conformity. They love it to just kind of even. But God, you've called us to a higher plane, a higher calling. God, if there's someone here this morning that doesn't know Jesus, I pray that we would be allowed to introduce them to the narrow gate. God, if there are Christians here who know that there's too much Gentile in their lives, Father, you convict them of that by your Spirit and let them step away from it. And God, if there's somebody here that wants to be a part of what you're doing here at this gathering, as we sing this last song, God, help us to obey you more than anything else. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.